Proverbs 5 and verse 5. Proverbs 5, 5. I'll read the verse that we just finished. Get a little bit of context. Speaking of the strange woman here, it says, But her end is bitter as wormwood and uh, bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. This is telling us what the end of her is going to be. This is where she's heading. Uh, the first verse there, verse 4, told us the feelings that she's going to have as she heads there. And verse 5 tells us where she's going. Now, before we get into the verse, I do have an interesting observation. This is one of the many places in the King James Version where you see its beautiful prose. Um, the New Bibles don't have this. Uh, let's just look at that verse, and I just want you to notice the alliteration. Alliteration is whenever the first letter of a, uh, words start with the same first letter of the first sound. Uh, it says, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. You see the alliteration? Down to death, hold on hell. New Bibles, you're smiling. Do you have something to say? I to say I thought that's when somebody couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> That's illiteration. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the now some people might might think, well, who cares if there's alliteration in the Bible? Who cares if it has poetic prose? Who cares about any of that? It should just be the Word of God. Just translate it word for word, and and it just says what it says, and it shouldn't matter if it flows smoothly and so on. But I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that at all. If the translation can be accurately and perfectly translated and the result of that accurate and perfect translation is a well-flowing, beautiful book that is poetic and has meter and reads well and is easy to memorize, then that's just more evidence it's the Word of God. And that's the way the King James is. The King James is so much easier to memorize than other versions. I was telling my cousin this, he's also a preacher, and um, I was talking to him and just feeling like picking a fight, apparently, and we were talking about Bible versions, and I sa he said something about reading the ESV or the NIV, and, and I, I told him that I read the King James, and I said, yeah, the, the NIV is uh, a lot easier to memorize. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I can, you can, I can memorize um, 16 entire verses in that in like three milliseconds. You're like, huh? Like, well, because they're gone. You know, memorizing nothing doesn't take any time. I've already got it memorized. You know, 16 verses, just I didn't even have to think about it. And, of course, then that opened a can of worms, and we got into a nice argument for a while uh, after that. But anyway, um, I was just kidding. But he thought, oh, yeah, the new versions are so much easier to memorize. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Because the King James, the way that it's written, and with the meter of it, and it just naturally flows off the tongue, and it's just, it's, it's just easier to memorize. I'll give you an example here. Uh, let's look at this same verse, Proverbs 5.5. 5. I'm going to look at, we're going to look at it in four different versions. First of all, the NIV, which uh, stands for the non-inspired version. It says, her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. Now, that doesn't sound as good as her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold on hell, does it? Doesn't sound as good to me. How about the ESV, the English Substandard Version? Uh, her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. Sheol. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to understand. Sheol is a they it's a transliteration. They basically took the Hebrew word and put it into the English. And if you don't know Hebrew, you don't even know what it means. Uh, Sheol is a, it's a word for hell. hell. Yes. And. The claim of the new translations is they're easier to understand. Oh, yeah. Yes, right. And then they use a word like shield. Right, exactly. And you can't even find that in a dictionary. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like the juice of the mallow. You know, in, in the book of Job, I always think about the, you know, how they're easier to understand, and there's some other what's crazy... The, what's the juice of the Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what. That... Well, I figured you would know which yeah. verse it was from. So oh, it's the know. oh, it's um, the what? Uh, I think it's the white of an egg. Is there any taste in the white of an egg? I think oh, it's the same yeah, verse. Yeah, they say the juice of the mallow. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the same verse. Yeah. I thought marshmallows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the juice yeah. of the mallow. <laughs> 
And then you have the uh, NASB, the uh, New Alexandrian Slanderous Bible. It is, her feet go down to hell, her steps take hold, or her, I'm sorry, her feet go down to death, thank you. Her steps take hold of Sheol. And then the New Living Translation, or the Not Living Translation, the NLT. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. They should get sued for copyright infringement because they copied the NIV word for word in that verse. You know why these new versions are all different, right? You can't, They cannot... Let's just say the NIV translated 75% of the verses in the Bible 100% accurately. It was a perfect translation. The subsequent versions to it could not translate it perfectly accurately because they would get sued for copyright infringement. So they would have to change the translation, even if it was perfect, and make it different so that they could copyright it so it would be different enough. And it's about the money. You're right. You're exactly right. I just think that's interesting. So anyway, we see how these new these versions, they just don't sound like the King James. They don't have that alliteration. They're not beautiful like it is. So now let's get into the verse. And you'll notice this, and maybe as we go through this, I will point out to you as we see verses that have that alliteration. Um, like uh, those sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Render a reason, right? There's just over and over again. You'll see it. If you start looking for it, you'll notice it all over the Bible. It's... It's really neat. Okay, so let's look at the first part of that. Her feet go down to death. So this is telling us that the strange woman is heading towards death. It tells us in Proverbs 2 and verse 18, which we looked at a while back in this study, that her house inclineth unto death. It says, For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. Now, we just defined incline not long ago. I think when we were looking at... Uh, verse 1, Proverbs 5, 1 in this chapter. And it said, bow thine ear to my understanding. And to bow is to like, you know, move yourself downwards. And I showed that um, that is a synonym of incline because incline means likewise to, to bow, to move downward. Um, so it makes sense that her house inclineth unto death. Her steps go down or her feet go down to death. Right? It's saying the, the same thing. And her house goes down to the chambers of death, we're told. Proverbs 7, verse 27. Chambers of death are, of course, the grave, right? The, you think about it, when you're put in a, in a tomb, that's a chamber for where the dead go. Proverbs 7, and verse 27. says, her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. And she takes her lovers with her there. If you have a death wish, just start hanging around with whores, and you'll get your wish. Uh, Proverbs 5 and verse 23, Solomon tells us the end of this young man that he is warning to not go to the strange woman. Here's what happens if he doesn't heed the warning. Proverbs 5, 23, he shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. So yes, the end is death. And I will talk about, in a subsequent study here, how that death can come about. I might actually talk about it here in a minute, and then I will elaborate on it more in a future study. And none that go unto the strange woman will take hold of the paths of life again, we're told in Proverbs 2.19. This says, None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Because Solomon here in chapter 2 is also talking about the strange woman. Verse 16, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. You remember in, when we looked at verse 19 here a while back, none that go unto her return again, neither take the hold of the paths of life. Remember how I said that they may not return at all. You, If you're in the strange woman's house and the husband comes home, you may uh, return carried by six you know, to... Uh, to the earth where you came from, or you may not return, so you're not going to return home alive, in other words, or you may not return home as the same man that you went as. Because when you come back, after you're found out, and you return with shame, and everybody remembers that you're the adulterer, right? You're not going to come home the same way you left. So none that go under her return again in that way. 
And we're told in Proverbs 7 and verse 26 that many strong men have been slain by her, that is, the strange woman. Proverbs 7, 26, For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. I think of Samson. Samson was the strongest man in the Bible that, that is recorded. And how was he taken down? By his wife. And she was, I don't know if she was a whore, but she was a strange woman in the sense of not being a good wife to him and betraying him to the Philistines, to other men, and, and talked him into telling her where he got his strength from. And after he gave her the runaround a few times, she finally pulled the old, if you love me, you'd tell me, right? That kind of thing. And so he told her, and you know the rest of the story. He got his uh, hair cut off and his eyes plucked out and then ended up dying. Um, a suicidal death. Sacrificial death as well. But. So anyway, my, many strong men have been slain by her. And, you know, how many men have, how many big, tough, either physically strong men or, you know, uh, financially strong men have been slain by the, by the strange woman? You know, many of them. How many people's careers have been ruined by a strange woman? Marriages, families have been ruined. Um, she has slain many. And following the strange woman can lead to death in many different ways. Uh, for instance, in Proverbs 5.11, you could die of an STD. It says, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And when we get to that verse here in a few weeks, I'm going to go into it in, in detail, and I'm going to tell you about STDs and give you some information about them. I just think it's good reminders and warnings to people because I don't think we realize how many people out there have them. It's unbelievable there are, there's like, I think it's over 100 million infections every year or something in America alone. It's unreal what's out there. So it's, it's good to be reminded of. So yes, you could um, die of an STD. You could die because her husband kills you. Uh, Proverbs 6 and verse 34 says, For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. So that could be your, your ticket to death. Or God could kill you for your sin. Remember Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And you remember two people named Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. And they lied to the Holy Ghost. They pretended as though they had, or they did sell their land, and they pretended as they were giving the whole price of the land to the apostles which they didn't have to do. They could have given part of it, just told them, here's part of it. But they gave part of it and pretended like it was the whole thing. They lied, and they died right there for it. Acts chapter 5, 4 through 5, Peter said, While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? See, the, the Jerusalem church was not practicing communism here. Right? They didn't have to give their possessions over. They did it willingly and voluntarily. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. That's a, an extreme example of them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear, like Paul told Timothy. That's, that's a rebuke. That's a pretty strong one. Uh, but I'll bet you there was nobody else in the Jerusalem church lying to God for a while after that little episode. He must so, have yeah. to look big and holy or something because yep. they didn't have to give it all. They yep. had to give any of it. Right. Probably. Yep. I'm assuming so. You know, that old sin of pride, wanting to look like you're something better than you are. So you could die of an STD, a husband could kill you, God could just get mad and kill you. Or if you don't die physically, you could experience death of fellowship in the church. In Romans one twenty nine. And 32. Her feet go down to death, and she can take many with her. Proverbs 1, 29. Romans, pardon me. You know what I meant. Romans 1, 29. This is the, the list of sins that people are given over to after they turn on God and worship the creature instead of the creator. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. One of those things there listed is fornication. And then what 
are people that do such things as fornication worthy of? Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So people that do those things are worthy of death. Now, of course, in a New Testament church context, the death there is a death to fellowship like the prodigal son experienced in Luke 15 and verse 24. Luke 15 and verse 24. You remember he took his his inheritance and he went off into a far land and he wasted it with riotous living. His brother said that he wasted it with harlots, uh, which was probably the case. And... What did he do? He went to a strange woman, assuming that his brother was correct. And what happened to him? He had a death to fellowship from his father. Luke 15 and verse 24 says, This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. So yes, he experienced a form of death. Um, Just the same form that we experience if we sin and we're excluded from the church. We are out of fellowship with God. It's as if... There's a separation. That's what death is, is a separation, right? When somebody dies, you don't spend time with them anymore. You don't see them anymore. Well, when somebody is excluded from the church, they are separated from God in that, in that sense, in a fellowship sense. And then let's get the second half of the verse. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. So the strange woman is heading towards hell. Her house is the way to hell, we're told in Proverbs 7, verse 27, Proverbs seven twenty seven. she could quite literally be headed to hell. Um, you know, she's not exactly showing forth the evidence that she's a child of God here. Um, or she could be heading towards hell as in hell on earth, you know, being, you know, suffering hellish-like things in her life. That could be also Proverbs 7, 27, it says, Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And like I said, she'll take whoremongers with her. Because God says that fornicators and whoremongers have their part in the lake of fire. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says that God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Whoremonger is one who spends time with whores. In other words, he's a fornicator. And we're told in Revelation 21 that their judgment, ultimately, if they are not under the blood of Christ, is going to be in the lake of fire. Hebrews, Hebrews, Revelation 21, and verse 8. This is speaking of the new heaven and the new earth. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Her steps take hold on hell, and so do those who spend time with her. Revelation twenty-two fifteen, Likewise, says, For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth, and maketh a lie. So if we want to have the assurance of eternal life, it is by fleeing whoremongering, fleeing fornication. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. Unfortunately, the people in this world that really need to hear this sermon probably won't, but it's all the teenagers in high school and all the college kids and all the unmarried people out there uh, that probably the majority of them are doing these things. They need to hear this. They, they're not going to hear it from me. I mean, they will if I get a chance, but chances are I won't. But hopefully they'll hear it from somebody. Hopefully somebody might hear this recording and somehow, some way, some young person or old person that needs to hear it, hears it and departs from iniquity. 1 Corinthians 6.18, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It is said that some parents even, how do you say, tolerate put oh, yeah. with it, like they give them, what do you call those? Condoms? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, even when I, when I was in school way back, 20, I was in probably like eighth grade or something. It was a long, long time ago, probably 20, 20 almost 25 years ago. And, and it was, things are a lot worse now than they were then. And I remember taking sex ed class and, and they were actually teaching abstinence in sex ed, which is surprising, really. And um, the, I think the teacher asked us maybe if we'd ever talk to our parents about it or what our parents said. And, and the one kid, my friend said, that his mom told him that, I think she told him to, to not have sex, but if you do, use a condom. It was like, I think it was eighth grade, or ninth grade or something. Here's this young kid, you know, barely in puberty, and his mom's telling him to use a condom. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, the strange woman also in Scripture represents false religion. Um, it's she. I think Proverbs five, six, and seven is primarily <laughs> speaking of a strange woman who's a whore. Um, but there is that aspect where the strange woman represents false religion, and it is something interesting to look at. But I wouldn't go spiritualizing away Proverbs five, six, and seven and say, "Oh, this is just referring to false religion." No, it's not. Right? There may be an application there, but that's not what it's talking about. And the only people that want to spiritualize that away are probably fornicators that want to get rid of the condemnation of their sin. But in, in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 5, there's a description here given of Mystery Babylon, which is a false religious system that started off way back in, in Babylon, probably even before that really it started the Tower of Babel, which... Babel became Babylon, and Babylon became a world empire, and then um, it was swallowed up by successive world empires, ending up in the Roman Empire. It was first taken over by the Medes and the Persians, who were taken over by the Greeks, who were taken over by the Romans. So ultimately, all that was Babylonian false religion ended up in the Roman Empire, and then when the Roman Empire fell apart, guess who took over from the Roman Empire? The Roman Catholic Church. It basically took Rome's place. Its headquarters was in Rome. The, the Caesar in Rome was called the Pontifex Maximus. Guess what title the Pope took? Pontifex Maximus. Right? The Roman Catholic Church took over from the, Roman, from, the, from the Roman Empire, and all of that Babylonian religion that was passed down from the Babylonians ultimately to the Romans ended up in Catholicism. And you can read, there's good books on this, like The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And he shows every single thing, from the mass, to the priesthood, to the prayers for the dead, to purgatory, you name it, incense and candles and all this stuff, the pagan holidays, all these things, the statues of Mary and Jesus. You go into a, Roman, you go into a Catholic cathedral and you see the statue of Mary holding the baby Jesus, that's uh, Isis and Osiris, or uh, Semiramis and the other, the other name for it. Um, everything in that ancient Babylonian religion was realized in Catholicism, was adopted by Catholicism. So I believe that Revelation 17 is at, le at least in large part referring to the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, is there other things wrapped up in there? Probably apostate Judaism and other occultic religion. Yeah, I, th I think so. But I think for reasons that I've given to you in the past, um, that that this is really referring to, in large part, the Roman Catholic Church. And look at what is said of her here in Revelation 17, 1 through 5. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. That's the strange woman, right? That sitteth upon many waters. Waters in scriptures are referring to peoples and nations. It tells us that there... Um, in, uh, in verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this whore is spanning many different countries and peoples, right? The Roman Catholic Church is all over the world, is it not? It's all through Europe. It's all through the United States. South America was you know, founded by Catholics. It's all in many waters. It's, it's all over the world. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see, this is referring to this false religious system as a whore and referring to what she does with the kings of the earth as fornication. You ever heard, hear about a corporation being in bed with the government? This is what it's talking about, right? The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. 
and the Roman Catholic Church was for centuries in bed with the government. And the government still would is. and still is. The government would carry out her murderous intentions. She would a lot of times sometimes she would kill the saints herself, but a lot of times she would turn them over to the authorities and they would kill the saints. The popes would be crowned by kings and kings would be crowned by popes. Um, they were they were in bed with the government and still are. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, like Mary, Mother of God, or calling the Pope Holy Father, things like that. Having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones. You ever see a Catholic cathedral? Pretty good definition of it right there. Having a golden cup in her hand, full of, the, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So she is a harlot and the mother of harlots. She has trained her daughters in her ways. Who are her, da- who are her daughters? The religions that came out of her. Protestants. Protestants, right. They're the religions that came out of her. Now, they didn't come out of her like God says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her plagues, right? That you receive none, of, that you be not partakers of her sins and receive of her plagues. They came out of her in the sense that they issued out of her, like a mother gives birth to children. They never left her. That's the problem. That's why they're so similar to her in many ways still. So the strange woman there is representing false religion. She also does so in... Proverbs nine thirteen through 17. We'll get there eventually, and we'll step through that chapter as well. That's, a, that's an interesting one. There's all kinds of... There'll be neat stuff. That'll be a fun chapter to go through when we get there. Proverbs chapter 9, 13 through 17. It says, A foolish woman is clamorous. I mean, she's loud, noisy, shouting. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. Usually, as uh, I forget who said it, um, they that know the least know it the loudest. I thought that was a pretty good saying. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. So this is the, the foolish woman, the strange woman. Now, the, the first part of Proverbs 9 talks about wisdom. And wisdom has a similar call to men. And I'm not going to get into all this now, but we will look at this later. And she says something, she starts off with a similar call, but then her call is perverted by the strange woman. The strange woman doesn't say, come eat of my bread and eat of the drink of the wine which I have mingled, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. No, she says, stolen waters are sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Secret is all about what these false religions are about. They would not stand up to the light of scrutiny if they did things in the open. They do things secretly. That's what false religions and occultic religions do. So here's the strange woman anyway. Again, we find in in Proverbs representing false religion. Now, idolatrous, idolatrous religion is described as whoredom in Exodus 34, 15. This is why it makes sense that that the I, this you know mystery Babylon this false religion is referred to as a whore because God in Scripture other places refers to idolatry as whoredom, Exodus thirty four and verse fifteen it says lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land this is the Lord warning them before they went into the land of Canaan and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. See, it was even condemned under the Old Testament to eat things sacrificed to idols. Likewise, we're told not to do that in the New Testament, Acts chapter 15. But anyway, the point that I wanted there was that the Lord did not want you to make a covenant with the people of that land because you'd end up going a whoring after their gods. He likens idolatry, worshiping other gods, to whoring. This is why the strange woman is... uh, used to to, uh, describe false religion. Now, her guests, that's the guests of the strange woman, that go to her house, 
like her house of worship, right? They are in the depths of hell, Proverbs 9 and verse 18. I just, the term house of worship is not wrong because God's church is called the house of God and it is a place of worship. So it's not wrong to call a church a house of worship. But I, that, that term just irritates me because when people use that, they use that to refer to all different types of religions, Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism and whatever. And so when you hear somebody in the media talk about houses of worship, I just, it just grates on me. I guess, because they're lumping us in with all the heathen, and I don't like that. But anyway, I'm not going to make a man an offender for a word. There's nothing wrong with calling a church a house of worship. But anyway, Proverbs 9 and verse 18 says, "For he." This is right after the passage we just read there about the strange woman representing false religion. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. So the guests in her house of worship are heading to hell. And that's pretty much where people in false religions are heading. They say that all roads lead to the same place, right? The universalists tell us that. And they're right. They all lead to hell, except for one, except for the right one. The one with the straight gate and the narrow way. So if men and women would like to have the assurance of eternal life, they better flee idolatry and false religion. Uh, just like if you want to have the assurance of eternal life, flee fornication, will flee idolatry and false religion likewise. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Most people would not agree with this. Most people would say, God is pleased as long as you're sincere. If you're sincerely worshiping him, God is okay with that. I'm going to tell you, no, he's not. There are times when God does accept sincere worship from his children that are doing so in ignorance and they don't know any better. And I have examples of that in the Old Testament, King Asa. You know, he, he did all kinds of good things. And it said, yet the high places were not taken down. Right? He had flaws. He had things that he did in ignorance that he didn't know. And he was sincere. Uh, and God accepted him. But it also says the sacrifice of the wicked is, is an abomination to God. So God is not just pleased with just any old Joe out there just doing whatever he thinks God's going to be happy with.